Hello, fellow toolboxers. Welcome to episode number 300 of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox podcast. Normally, when we do like a 300 episode, we plan it out and go big. But to be honest, I've been so backed up with work. I'm just punching out these interviews and stuff like that. And number 300 just came up, but I'm really happy that this one is 300 because our interview is with a fellow immigration lawyer, congresswoman, a state congressperson, uh, Sandra Feist. And uh, it, the interview was so fun and interesting and so many different angles to her personality, which I was interested in learning about. So I'm really happy that this one came out to number 300. So definitely worth listening to, to look at different aspects of the way to be an immigration lawyer and live a life of an immigration lawyer and how to come up uh, on doing all this kind of stuff. I want to thank uh, all the supporters that we have who email us just to say thank you for the work that we do and to, to, to you know talk about themselves. Always feel free to email me. I always want to learn more about who's following us, and especially if you're an immigration lawyer, add you to the newsletter so we can update you on content and stuff that's coming up. Um, the marriage immigration course I was going to redo, I was going to record it piece by piece and then publish it. But I realized I'm never going to get this done if I, unless I do it live uh, and have a regular session to where the energy is going back and forth, not just me one way in a room, but I want to, some, some people there to feed it. So we're just going to do a course six weeks, um, two hours a week. If you're interested, we're probably going to give a big deal, um, special pricing for those who sign up for the live show and then increase that afterwards once you have to edit it, spend all that time into it. So email me as soon as possible. Info at Immigration Lawyers Toolbox, their marriage immigration, fiance, I-751. Um, the basics you get get things going to have be successful and a sustainable independent path towards uh, your future so you can do what you want to do and have fun like I do so having said that I do want to thank our sponsor who's been supportive of the magazine uh, and the podcast you all know him already uh, Serenade a technology company has been a transformative leader in the immigration space for nearly three, 30 years immigration by Serenade is a modern practice management software for immigration focused legal professionals to manage their cases, clients, forms, billing, and much more and with an all-in-one solution, intuitive interface, and bank rate security. Our office has it. Uh, we have a whole portion of our team that uses it um, exclusively, so they're really enjoying it. Uh, the software is trusted by tens of thousands of happy attorneys and paralegals who use it to save hours of time for both themselves and their clients. Immigration has the highest rating for immigration software and the most popular software review website, Captera. And over the past year has won the most awards in categories, including most likely to recommend, best support, best ease of use, best value, and a handful of other ones. Real good stuff. It's worth mentioning one last thing. What really separates the immigration from the pack is it's comprehensive across over 100 features. These include features you might not use today, but you can save your save you time by using them tomorrow, like e-filing systems. E-immigration is the only platform that offers e-filing for all USCIS forms. Stop paying for multiple software and let e-immigration handle all your practice needs. Get more information and schedule a private demo today by visiting Serenade's website, calling 1-800-617-4202 or emailing sales at serenade.com. That's Serenade with a C, not an S. Um, you're going to like them. A really good team behind the scenes. I talk to them regularly. Really good people. I, I really enjoy my time with them. So having said that, we'll get the interview started. I'm going to start uh, collecting articles for the next issue of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox magazine. If you have an idea, you're good at something, and you want to share that knowledge with the, with the immigration community, write us you know, a good article. Uh, email me. Let me know the topic, and we could take it from there. Um, there's a lot more stuff that we do. Let's just leave it as that. And if you wherever you're watching this, just put a five-star real quick so that people can learn about the great work we're doing here. Uh, without further ado, let's get it started. Now, the information right here is considered individual legal advice, consult an immigration attorney, but you all know that already. Well, Sandra, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, you have a, such an interesting background, um, just not only doing immigration law, but getting involved in uh, representation of, of your community. So I thought it'd be really interesting for, for our listeners to get to know your path, how you got there, and all the different options available when you do practice law and you do practice immigration law, it opens it all up. So could you have some background of uh, yourself and how you got into immigration law? Yeah, yeah. So I um, was planning to be a Broadway star until after I graduated from undergrad. And when I graduated from UW-Madison, I decided I was actually not a very good dancer. And so I got real. Um, so I moved down to New Orleans to sing. Um, and so I was singing jazz in New Orleans, um, but that does not involve making enough money to survive. And so I applied for a job for a paralegal position at an immigration firm down in New Orleans. And um, I got that job. That was right around um, the 245I deadline. So this was January 2000. And they just needed a warm body, no experience required, no qualifications, just bachelor's degree and willingness to work hard. Um, so I, I started 
started out as a paralegal and um, I decided to go to law school to become an immigration attorney after 9-11. Um, so I had seen the way that my clients were being treated by the government and I felt like I needed to stand up and do more for my clients than I could as a paralegal. And so I was at the uh, conference for the American Immigration Lawyers Association in 2003 and um, I was just inspired by a panel that I was at. Um, it was Lucas Gutentag from the ACLU National Immigrants Project and uh, Professor Hiroshi Motomura. Um, and I think he's at UCLA right now yeah. or UC Davis. So anyway, he rocks. Um, so the two of them were presenting and I was just like, I need to go to law school. So, um, so yeah, so I started law school down in New Orleans. Um, and then I evacuated, uh, here to Minnesota after Hurricane Katrina. Um, I had family here and, um, I met my husband, uh, immediately. And so I stayed forever. Um, so, so yeah, so I, um, graduated from law school in 2007. And so I've been practicing immigration law since then. And I've been working in the field since 2000, or I guess is 2001. Your, is your spouse a lawyer as well? He is. Yeah. He is the um, chief programs officer for the ACLU of Minnesota. So he oversees their lobbying, litigation, and community organizing. I see. So when you uh, graduated Keene Immigration Law, did you work with the people or for other people or did you branch on your own immediately? So um, I... Um, I worked for five years as a paralegal and then law clerk for a wonderful firm down in New Orleans, um, David Ware and Associates, um, yeah. doing combination of employment-based and family-based immigration law. And then when I evacuated here, I immediately started working for a great firm up here, um, Aronson and Associates. And so I worked for them for uh, the rest of my law school um, career. So two years, then three years as an attorney. And so I'd been working for 10 years in the field of immigration law when I decided that I would like to start my own firm. And that is when I went out on my own. Now, you have the perspective of being a paralegal and a lawyer. What can you say about the differences in, in like what you perceive what you were doing as a paralegal as opposed to lawyer? Uh, just any any thoughts that you may have on that? Yeah. So um, I feel like being an immigration paralegal, it's obviously a highly technical specialized role in the process, but I also feel that it's a really important role of being sort of the emotional support for the client, making sure that they are responded to promptly, making sure that they feel heard, making sure that they know that we know that they aren't just, you know, another um, you know, IT professional from India, like they are a person yeah. with hopes and dreams. And like, we, we um, really rely in this profession on paralegals to make sure that clients feel seen and truly supported. Um, when I decided to go to law school, I really didn't understand the true fundamental differences between the roles. And part of me thought that, you know, once I'm a lawyer, I'll be even more reassuring and more supportive. Sure. And um, and I realized pretty quickly that that is not the role of the attorney. Um, obviously being a like warm, supportive expert presence in the client's immigration journey is incredibly important. But um, I also realized that my role is now to be the expert in the law and to advise them in an effective manner. And so I, it's interesting. I feel like immigration paralegals are uniquely specialized and it is a career that you can have, you know, very successfully, like without ever transitioning to law school. And as a paralegal, I really kind of didn't understand what um, the un unauthorized practice of law was necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I work hard as a manager of paralegals to make sure they understand what is the role of the attorney, what are the ethical dividers between those two sure. roles. I think I think those that that line can get muddy in a unique way in immigration law. Very true. Very true. So how, how did you have the courage or what 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 got you into you know starting your own firm? Was there like just a lot of times you're so people are so frustrated with what they what they're doing that just you know what I'll just do on my own or something or what gave you the impetus to do that and then follow up with that? What did you read any books or anything in particular that helped you to get to get there? Yeah. So so what I generally tell people is that a lot of times, maybe most of the time, when people start their own firm, it it might be because they don't like working with other people <laughs> and they really want to be their own boss and decide how things go. Um, you know, they're a rebel. 
Um, and then another reason is they don't like the business model of the private practice of law. They don't like the idea of being leveraged, that they're bringing in a certain dollar amount and then their employer is making, you know, more money than them. Um, and, and I never really had either of those impetus for starting my own practice. I enjoyed working in a firm setting. I didn't have any problem with the fact that my employer was the one taking on the risk and therefore they got a greater reward. Um, I just kind of came to a point in my career where I was feeling dissatisfied with my current um, setting, like feeling like I needed to branch out. You know, I think it's sometimes hard to transition from being a paralegal to an attorney within the same firm. Sometimes it's hard to like find your identity yeah. and you know, be a full-fledged attorney in the eyes of your colleagues and your boss. And so I was just feeling a little bit stifled. And um, at that time, my husband was working at the Minnesota Attorney General's office with my now law partner, and uh, my law partner was leaving. And so we all got together for coffee. I had a newborn baby. And so we all have this like memory of like the formation of the firm where we were all hanging out for coffee, holding the baby. And um, and like a conversation about me referring work to um, Jeff became a conversation about starting a firm together. Mm -hmm. And so it happened very spontaneously and organically and not with you know, a lot of this like planning and thinking about like being an entrepreneur. Um, it's interesting because now I feel like I was just destined to be self-employed. I love, like it added this level of challenge that I needed in my career because I had been working in the same area of law for 10 years at that point. Like I knew how to do an H-1B. I knew how to do a green card. I knew the basic, you know, laws that applied to my clients' situations. And I think adding that extra level of pressure and creativity to like um, build a book of business um, just was incredibly satisfying. And it feels very predestined in retrospect. How did you initially start building your book of business? Most of my clients came with me. So I started out with the book of business. Um, it was interesting. I, I had assumed when I started my firm that I was going to do a pretty good mix of immigration law. Like I was going to, I took on some cancellation cases, um, was going to do, you know, a lot of asylum and, but also employment-based, family-based. I had this idea that I would do everything. Um, but the firm that I was with was primarily employment-based. And so that my practice has just continued on that trajectory since I started out with um, a base of, um, you know, a lot of biomedical researchers, engineers, IT professionals, teachers, and so, so yeah, so I, I just kind of transitioned to a similar practice. And has your growth been uh, mostly referrals or do you do a, a, like major marketing techniques or campaigns or anything like that? It's all client referrals. I do not do any marketing. Um, but I mean, being in politics um, has definitely elevated my reputation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think that a ton of work is directly related to my work as a public person. Um, but I, de I definitely think it doesn't hurt um, to have that additional sort of um, profile in the community. For sure. Now, uh, your, your partner that came with you when, you when he retired from Attorney General's office, was he already into immigration or like? So he actually, we have a super weird partnership. He doesn't do immigration at all. Oh. Um, he is a commercial litigator and he is the national expert on RICO law. So whenever you're reading a random article about Trump, it might be quoting my law partner. Um, he um, and I are really good friends, but we don't do anything like in our practices that intersect. We've tried over the years um, because, you know, litigation is much more uneven in terms of revenue and immigration law, especially corporate immigration law is like pretty steady. And so over the years, there have been attempts where we've said, Jeff, you should do some immigration law, but he's a, he's like 10 years older than me. And he always was like, nope, I know my thing. And so, so yeah, so, um, so really all, well, for sure, all of the immigration practice of my firm is me. And then he does his thing. Um, but I do have three attorneys now who work for me. So we've, we've built the immigration team over the you years. Know, this is probably like a whole different show, but like the idea of having a, law partner does something completely different and how that all works and even why it would work like because it's how does that it, it doesn't make sense i know I, i'm not i don't mean to be distracted. like does it make sense or i don't know like how that, that works it 
doesn't make any sense really. Um, initially we had some idea of some like sort of symbiotic cross referrals and that happens every once in a while, but not on a regular basis. Um, so I, I don't know how much I share about like our profit sharing or anything. Yeah, that, that, that I don't know about, yeah. That. But, um, you know, I, I don't think it's normal and I don't think that our arrangement between each other is normal, <laughs> um, but there's um, a lot of trust and friendship yeah. built up over the so years. It's a unique thing. It's not something like everyone could just pull out and do, okay, okay. I definitely <laughs> would not recommend it as a business model. It's a unique thing that works between two close friends. Yeah, it makes um, sense. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's really nice. I think one of the things about starting your own practice is that it can be daunting in terms of just like a lot of like malpractice insurance and setting up the entity. Like there were a ton of really specific technical, ethical, procedural steps that we needed to take to start our firm in the beginning. And he had been in private practice, had his own firm in the past. And so um, you know, having a law partner who was a bit older, who had that experience and wisdom and was able to like handle a lot of that was incredibly meaningful to being able to start the firm in the first place. So I do think like, just in terms of like tips for people starting their own firm, like there is a lot of that you should be prepared to like figure it out on your own. Or if you do yeah. have, you know, um, a colleague who can figure it out with you, that's really beneficial. Yeah, you've done like really well. So you have three attorney associates to help you with yet. What was the timeline of that growth and and uh, the need to to get those? I mean, you have in Minnesota, if people don't know, it's like a very unique area where you have these big medical practices, you have big corporations there that I'm sure you have clients, so it really is a big boost. But how was the process? Because I'm in the process of hiring and growing too. Um, it's kind of scary because it's a big payroll expense, make sure you have enough work, learning to manage people, especially you know, high value employees. The high value sets that they, they cost a lot of money and, and a lot could go wrong if it's wrong. So uh, what has been your process uh, going through that learning and, and, and doing it? Yeah, it. I, I would say that managing people is still the hardest thing I do in my life mm -hmm. um, as a law partner, a adjunct professor and a politician. I still think managing people is is definitely the hardest thing that I do. Um, it happened fairly organically. I started out doing literally everything on my own. Um, it's a nice benefit of having been a paralegal for so long. I didn't need somebody to tell me how to like, you know, fill in an LCA, yeah. um, or, you know, fill in the forms. And I had all sorts of practical skills, like making copies, <laughs> mailing things. Um, it's surprising how many people just graduate from law school and are like, I have no useful skills. I just know the law. Um, and so I started out just like doing it all myself. And then I, I started, um, hiring like a part-time law clerk and then a part-time paralegal, then a full-time. Um, I think that before I ever thought to hire an attorney, I had two full-time case managers at that point. Then I started out like with contracting attorneys mm -hmm. and, um, really the, the level of commitment to building team of three attorneys and we now have four full-time case managers and two part-time law clerks and an administrative support professional like like it it um it happened kind of gradually and then when I was elected in 2020 I really needed to make some big decisions about how to make sure that I was doing right by my clients and living up to my very high standards of service and ethics yeah. And also able to represent my constituents in the legislature, yeah. which in Minnesota is a part-time legislature, so it's in the spring. Um, and so I grew pretty quickly over the last three years. I think um, probably doubled my size just in the last three years. Wow. Yeah, it, so it's been it's been definitely like it's a leap of faith. It's a risk, um, but you have to be comfortable with that when you're yeah. self-employed. And and I I feel really satisfied and grateful for having such an amazing team that's wonderful now you mentioned the case managers what is the difference between a case manager and a paralegal nothing oh. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why like sometimes like in some firms they're paralegal sometimes they're case managers i like case manager because it's i think it makes it more clear that it's not just about like formatting briefs and and you know submitting things to a court that that it's um managing the process mm -hmm. so it's you know the client understands that they'll be the ones reaching out to make sure that they've collected all of the necessary documents answering basic procedural questions um you know 
driving timelines and, you know, yeah. um, I think case, and I, I think case manager is the right title because I think it, it elevates the role above paralegal. And I think that it is a unique role within the field of like, just within the legal profession. That makes total sense. Yeah. I, I like that. Um, it, uh, a lot of questions about immigration law and practice are as, a, as the nature of a show. I want to get into how you balance, and first of all, how you got to university position and also politics, but uh, I guess one more question, do you, uh, two more questions. What do you, to, to keep track of all this, do you have any KPIs or measurements to, uh, that you, to, to, did you use to keep track? Um, so my law partner uh, handles like the official books. And so I have like big picture numbers from him. Um, I have a really funky Excel spreadsheet that works for me to like look year after year, month after month, and I can go back. I think I started it in its current format in like 2014. Um, so I can do comparisons. Um, my One of my wonderful associates who I hope will be my law partner in the um, not so distant future, she's... Um, utilizing our new software that we've gotten in the past like year and a half to do more breakdowns of revenue by attorney mm -hmm. who's generated it and so um so she's doing some additional number crunching that i think is helpful just so that we can understand who's bringing in what type of work and how much work and that we can compare that also with like our staffing levels because we're definitely pretty dynamic in terms of what our staffing levels are and if we ever need to staff up um, and so, um, so some like those comparisons, those numbers that she's been crunching, I think provide additional clarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I uh, recently just, uh, I got into QuickBooks. I, I had an Excel sheet for 10 years, 12 years. Mm -hmm. and then I got QuickBooks and I was like, I can't believe I was using it. My Excel sheets were terrible. Now I look back at the time it made total mm -hmm. sense, but now I was like QuickBooks so much better. And then I, mm -hmm. this, a couple months ago, I broke it down. So like, case type of revenue I've tried like it's, the charts got super long now but like mm -hmm. it, it helps a lot uh but do you, yeah. when you say brought in do you mean like they originated the cases they were like they found the client or that the case they're handling no just case they're handling um one of my attorneys brings in a meaningful amount of work but most of the work is still just generated by me real cool so um, we just you know um we use law pay that's something that we've integrated um mm -hmm in the past like year, year and a half. And that's now how we're doing some further breakdowns. And then we also use QuickBooks. Yeah, it's it, it, this, what's the volume starts going up, getting all this tech and I'm, I'm, I'm too cheap. I'm like, I don't want to pay for this stuff. But, and so I was dragging my heels, but like, uh, you know, you got to get into it because of the, the analysis. Do you have any unconventional, not just the money, but like other things you have to do to track? Like time is one, like how much people are working and stuff. So is there any other things like that you do as different, you think, or? Um, one thing that I've done recently is we do a lot of writing intensive cases. So a lot of O1s, EB1s, national interest waivers, yeah. fees. Um, and I have had this sense for a while, like as we've transitioned from me doing most of the case management and writing on those cases, like in the beginning to like having a paralegal and me and now having like an, me and an associate and a paralegal and sometimes a contractor. And so I've had this real sense as we've added more layers that that part of our practice has become painfully inefficient mm -hmm. and not profitable. Yeah. Um, and so over the last year, I've been really looking at that and looking at, like, I've asked for more information from the attorney who works mostly on these cases around timelines. Like, when did we open up our cases? When are we filing them? And just trying to dig in based on those numbers to figure out um, how long is it taking on average? How much money are we charging? And how do those two things align? And basically what I found out that was like, I intuited, but I was like, I'm basically bringing in this money to pay people to do these cases. And yeah. I'm like, that's not, that's not how that's supposed to go down. Like you're supposed to actually like make money. Like they're, they're hard cases. Like I'd like this to be profitable. And it's a big part of our practice. So, so I think, um, that was just something I decided to do was ask the attorney. I, I had her give me, when did we open every single case that we filed this year? I asked her in July. And so from January through July, we could look at when did we open? When did we file? And that provided a helpful picture and it allowed us to have some more concrete conversations about why is it taking so long? What is it about our process and our approach and delegation? And, you know, and, and like, there's always this real tension in, 
maybe in all areas of law, but I feel it really in immigration law between efficiency and attention to detail. Yeah. And so I always tell my, I tell my staff, like the goal is to A, get the case approved. That is like the amount of work that is required. And then B, make sure our clients know that we understand their case and we care about them. And I was like, anything you're doing that is beyond those two objectives is like a waste of time. Like it needs to be like a, a, like a high quality approvable case and our client needs to feel like we see them. Yeah. And so sometimes people just are like, I've hired some really beautiful writers over the years and sometimes they just get super into the writing. And I'm like, mm, yeah. you are overwriting these cases. You are over-researching these letters. So. Yeah, you know, a couple of years ago, I realized like I was really into L's and you got these our fees that would take forever with L's. And mm -hmm. I had to cut it all out to just do basically marriage cases because as you said, like you're you're just paying for costs. You're not making a profit on these. And mm -hmm. so we're yeah. getting back now that I have a team of other associates and a bigger team. And it's all me getting back into it. But like, first, you have to charge a lot for these cases inevitably because they are so time consuming. It's not some people do it on the cheap, like, you know, a couple grand for something that should be like three times that. But I'm like, either they're just changing the name on the case or something like that. Or I don't know. I don't know how they're doing that to make it a reasonable case. They're probably just not making enough money. Yeah. Like, I don't ever give quotes to prospective clients before I talk to them, because when I talk to them, I make it clear we are not a bargain basement law firm that will do bare essentials, which sometimes that's all people want. Yeah. Um, I'm like, we are, we will hold your hand through this process. We will be on a flat fee, completely accessible to you. Like we will do a, a high quality, thoughtful product. We're not going to rush it. Um, like, obviously it's timely, but um, yeah. I just make it clear to people. Like if you want, if you're looking at attorneys to find the cheapest one, that yeah. won't us. But then, you know, you can convince people that, that actually, when they think about it, they don't want the cheapest one. They want like the most skillful, supportive one. Mm -hmm. It's such an important thing. I was on my to-do list of questions, but I skipped it. it was just about this conversation. Like, because uh, we get a lot of leads with people on the price. And I know I'm challenging myself to like, how do I, because uh, they won't schedule a consultation. How do I inform them of this complexity situation? Sometimes, most of the time, probably these people are not going to understand anyways, if they're just asking how much the price is, because that's what they do. That's someone in a TikTok post. So yeah, I call around to get the best price on one of my videos, because they're like, mm -hmm. someone charge a lot. But it's like, it's, it's a different thing. It could be like, 99% the same, but you have one piece of information or one connection or one handholding that makes a complete difference in your life. And that's where you try, strive to do that one thing that's going to be different than the other people or, or just the, in your life. Uh, but it's like, how do you get people to, to hear that, understand that? If you had to talk with them, a consultation, then it's hard. Like even yourself, now you have, do, you, do you do all the consultations yourself or do your team members do them? I do not any longer do all the yeah, consultations. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. I, yeah, for a really get, long yeah. time. Probably until the last year, I tried to do all of them. But now I, I trust my team and um, try to make sure that I'm still present in cases, yeah. even if I didn't do the consult. But there's some I need to. I still have the most sophisticated skills in terms of communicating with prospective clients. Yeah. And yeah, that, but that's like a big really thing. Good, so. yeah, I don't that, mean to like just my team. They're amazing. Yeah, no, I hear you, but it's just hard to, it's like your baby. It's like give it to someone else mm -hmm. and you want to get involved, but you got to like, stop that's a, it's been a big mental psychological issue for me to deal with the last couple of years yeah it's really hard I think that if I had not run for office I would never have been able to delegate and trust to the extent that I do mm -hmm. um and and I and I would be fine with that like I really I do love my firm and my clients and I I, I would like in a perfect world I'd like to clone myself and have them all have full <laughs> access to me um, but in an imperfect world, like, like in, um, the seven habits of highly effective people, he talks about the difference between like managing and leading. And so I've, I've like moved into the role of leader of the firm and just making sure people understand like, what is our ethos? What is our level of quality and service and compassion? Like I, I try to really make it clear to people, like, I, like, you're not there to just do the work. You're there to like, be like a compassionate friendly presence throughout this process so yeah. trying to make sure that people can infuse into their own work what i try to bring when i meet with people directly yeah exactly that's it i hear you so um i could talk a lot of this is come this is where i'm at right now so like uh, it's a big conversation but i, I know you got your limited time so i want to get into two other topics one is quickly when did you get into teaching at university uh, i know you teach my friend over there um uh, what, what how did you what was the train? How did you get that position, and what do you what do you teach? All that kind of stuff. 
Yeah. So um, this will be my third year teaching with Scott. And um, I always had thought that I would love to teach immigration law. Um, I don't know that I really understood what that desire really was until I did it. But I always thought that that would be really satisfying to mm -hmm. kind of shape and mold future immigration lawyers and just future lawyers in general. Um, Scott interned with me a while ago now, and then he went to St. Thomas and they reached out to him and they generally like to have two professors co-teach um, kind of with different and varying levels of experience. And so he reached out to me um, to see if I would be interested and I was definitely interested. Um, and so then I met with the school and kind of shared information about my background and experience. Um, so it all just kind of came to me. I wasn't really looking for it specifically. Um, I was already... I think, was I already, was I running for office at the time? Like I was already in politics and I, I wasn't, this is like the pattern in my life is I was like, Oh, I don't know if I have the bandwidth. I don't know if I should do this, but I've always wanted to. And my husband telling me like, you should go for it. Mm -hmm. Like you've always wanted to do this. And, um, and so just being supported at home, I've got two kids. So, um, so yeah, so it's, um, it's honestly very, very hard. Um, so like, so you're an adjunct too, right? I, I I stopped. It was too much. It's oh, really hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. You to understand. Yeah. <laughs> I, my whole theory of the case. So I was I was like really. It, I it was a struggle for me because I like my theory is that my I had a mismatched um, alignment of like my expectations were really high and my skill level was really low. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm really good at immigration law, but like teaching, teaching is his own thing. Though. Yeah. Yeah. So like last year, my, my skill level went up a bit and my expectations went down a bit and they still wasn't like aligned, but I'm like, this is the year that my, my skill level will go up. My expectations will be reasonable and, um, and hopefully it'll work out. Like my, my goal, I'm changing up my whole curriculum this year. I was working, we were working from a traditional textbook and it just really isn't, great for immigration law to do that. So now we're going to work from a law materials, just providing more practical summaries and, and reading materials for the various areas of immigration law. And I think it will, I think it will be more natural to my own kind of style of education. Cause I'm very like in the weeds, like whenever I present at a conference, I'm the one who's like really practical, like and not high level theory, but like really yeah. practical. Here's how you approach these types of technical challenges. And so I think it'll be a much more satisfying, like, I think each year is hopefully going to get better. And then they say like after three years, things click mm -hmm. and then you like get more confident and it doesn't take quite as much mental energy. Um, so, yeah, so I would say like, it's a labor of love. It's not coming naturally to me, but I mean, I'm pretty hard on myself. Like students seem fairly satisfied and we had over um, enrollment this year. So we gave permission mm -hmm. 10 more students so I think we're gonna have 40 students in the class so I guess they like it yeah, yeah. maybe they just I, like Scott though maybe they're just putting up with me this is another topic we got to sit and talk about do another episode about teaching all that stuff and be, I should get to have more people on and talk about that because it's a whole thing it's just like a, it's a whole thing uh yeah. it, it, just create a curriculum itself and and so you have a full it's a course is everything immigration or is it like mm -hmm. uh yeah. yeah so yeah. it's just so much to talk about and it's overwhelming for i, I realized like i'm overwhelmed the hell of these students like that's too much information for them yeah and my plan is to go deeper rather than wider because the textbook tried to like touch on everything yeah and like i think i'm gonna do a whole class that's just on h's this year rather than trying to shove in like M's, like who cares about vocational students? I mean, I, I'm sure they're lovely people, but like my students so don't rare, yeah, so know. And like, they're just like, I was trying to shove in some like physician J1 stuff. And I feel like it would be more kind of intellectually meaningful to like really dive into the interesting nuances of H1Bs than to try to cover like literal entire alphabet soup of non-immigrant visas. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's immigration. One of my friends here in LA, uh, he made it to a five unit course. And so it's a lot of hours. And so mm -hmm. less students do it, but it's really intense because there's so many units. Mine mm -hmm. was like two, maybe three units, uh, mm -hmm. at Loyola out of Pepperdine. Uh, but, uh, it's just a lot of work. And I, I, I keep thinking I'm doing a disservice because it's just, I'm inundating with so much information and they're kind of, sometimes I would see their eyes. They're like, what's going on with like all these letters and numbers and stuff. And I was like, you know, 
I need to spend so much time doing a good job on this that I just can't, I can't do it. So I, I passed the baton to someone else, but it was a really cherished experience. I have a good relationship with the, the student. A lot of them are immigration lawyers now. So a lot of my four students are like better than me at doing EB1s and NIWs now and stuff like that. It's just amazing to see that, that happen. Uh, yeah, so okay, so let's, it. It. I'm sorry. You must have been good at it if you have so many of your former students actually went into the profession. Yeah, they really, it's, I mean, like the thing about immigration is they already like it so much you're coming in. A lot of them want to do humanitarian work, asylum stuff, which I don't do. So there, a lot of them are dissatisfied because I kind of do lip service to that portion of the class and they go into family-based and employment-based. Uh, mm -hmm. But a lot of the humanitarian ones end up doing, uh, you know, business kind of stuff and they're they're doing great and then, like it's amazing. So yeah, it's it's, it's really wonderful. So uh, let's talk because I know you're I'm keeping you here longer than I, than I expected, but it's, well, so it's an interesting conversation. <laughs> So what made you want to pull the trigger on politics? It's just it's so demanding, so personal, so chaotic nowadays. And you have a practice and kid, how old are your kids? They are now 11 and 13. Okay, so I, I have babies. So it's like, there's no way I can do something like that. But maybe mm -hmm. does it get more manageable at 11 and 13 or is it still chaos? <laughs> um, it's still chaos. I think the key to life for everyone, like if you want to be like wow. hardcore about your career is you need a partner at home yeah. who is going to like support you a hundred percent and allow you to like give your energy where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it definitely, I don't know. I enjoy having my kids at the age they're at. It's pretty fun. Like this Friday, I've got a parade and my daughter can't do the parade with me because she's doing another part of the parade because she's in a production of Newsies with the community theater. So she'll be like in another float. But um, my son, like all of his soccer buddies, they always come to the parades and throw candy for me and wear Feist for House shirts. Um, so it's fun. And like my daughter's um, whole fifth grade toured the Capitol. And so I got to show her whole class like where I sit on the house floor Um and yeah, yeah, I, I it, it has always worked pretty well. It was interesting when I first ran, it was an open seat and there were a lot of people who wanted it because we're in a very, you know, democratic district. So it's a really, really good seat for a Democrat. And so um, there was, it was really unlikely that I would get it. And um, my daughter, so I guess she was like nine at the time uh, or eight. She wrote me a letter and she was like, I know you're gonna win. Like, you know, you've got this. And I was thinking it would have been a good life lesson for them both if I lost, just to yeah. see like how hard I worked and that sometimes it doesn't yeah. work out, but you still go for it. But then I won. So I don't know if I'm <laughs> not good life that lessons or not. Um, but yeah, it's it's amusing. Um, yeah. So yeah, it works to have kids. You just have to have a partner um, who yeah. really supports you. And so for for me, my husband was a lobbyist with the ACLU for a while, and he, he now has his current job that oversees that role. But yeah. Um, the seat opened up and we knew what we were getting into and we talked about it and we just, we just thought, you know, we have careers that we love and we find meaningful. We're like, we have enough money. Um, but we felt like we had more that we wanted to give, um, in like service to the community in the state. And so it's like, it's truly like a joint undertaking. Um, and so we made the decision together that I should just go for it. Um, I had always like thought maybe I would run for office or not always, but it was just kind of always kind of in the ether and Ben was really in politics. And so we were just in those circles. And um, I, I just was super angry after being um, an immigration lawyer under the Trump administration for four years. Yeah. And it just felt, you know, I've, I work in immigration advocacy um, through AILA National and I'd been doing it since I was paralegal in 2001. And it just felt very futile at that moment. Like, I just felt like I had been working so hard to make like national change. And it just felt like I could do that forever. And it wasn't clear if anything would ever change. And yeah. so when the opportunity to do something really concrete at the state level opened up, it felt like the right way to refocus my energy for a time. Um, and we've gotten a ton of immigration bills passed because um, I'm just like, Single mind. I mean, I do a lot of juvenile justice and other stuff too, yeah. but like we changed the definition of gross misdemeanor by one day. So now it's never going to be an ag felony. Mm -hmm. um, I had a bill to create a permanent office of new Americans with $750,000 in funding ongoing forever. Um, I, we, SIJS was getting cut off at 18 because of how Minnesota state courts work. So I fixed that by creating this weird guardianship thing. 
Um, and that was bipartisan. Um, we have a U visa bill that I got passed um, to require law enforcement to respond within a period of time nice. after somebody submits the cert request. Um, so, so yeah, there've been tons of immigration yeah. things we've been able to do. Um, well, obviously we did driver's license for all this year too, which is very exciting. Um, what I love about the U visa thing is like, whenever you talk about immigration reform on federal level, it's this massive bill. And I'm like, oh, it's just gonna be a piece of too much crap that's gonna happen because immigration is so nuanced. like. Only an immigration lawyer would say that those changes that you made, though adding one day this and that, mm -hmm. just it, to have this non-immigration lawyer do this big bill, like it's it's just going to end up messing. There's going to be a huge problems with it. So I'm, I'm kind of mm -hmm. like, I'd rather have these little pieces, but with mm -hmm. it, it's just not going to happen because it's so nuanced with immigration. But another thing I love is um, the way you, as a political scientist, um, the the part time nature where people from the community could actually live life, have be in the community and mm -hmm. do it. It's not a full time like career politician kind of thing. That really makes a difference because you could bring what you know from the community into the practice instead of just being there and only dealing with lobbyists twenty four seven. Is this so? It's, you know, lobbyists part of the game. This is what it is, but you, you're in the community, so you actually could bring stuff from there. So that model yeah. works really well. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I feel very strongly the same. Like some people say, like, oh, if we didn't have a part time legislature, people could spend more time legislating, um, and you know, and we could make more money. Like we definitely don't make money. <laughs> um, but um, to me, like not being a like career politician. I mean, some, a lot of people are career politicians at the state level, but I think like allowing people like me who are primarily an immigration attorney to also help craft law and be in the legislature, I think is good for the state of politics in Minnesota. If you could, if, I'd rather have less laws, but finally crafted laws that meet the specific <laughs> need like this. And like, you just need people who have expertise to do it because uh, especially immigration, it's just like, no one's going to understand any of that. And yeah. And, you know, I was you so disappointed that Margaret Stock didn't get elected to the Senate. That would have yeah. been amazing. Last was a hard seat, so that's it's, yeah. there's a lot of a lot of money there, so it's like it's just a whole thing. Um, yeah. uh, you mentioned you, you were doing a list stuff when you're paralegal. We have a good contingent of paralegals to watch this. Is it, a, I guess, a strong recommendation that even if you're a paralegal, get involved with ALA, go to the events and stuff like that? Um, you know, I don't know how, like, I definitely went to the ALA conferences as a paralegal, and that was a really valuable experience. That was something that my employer down in New Orleans did for mm -hmm. his team. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I found it really nice networking and being amongst the immigration legal profession. Um, I got more involved once I was in law school, and I've been really involved with ALA always. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I value ALA so much. Um, I'm a mentor through their mentorship program. I've been on the media advocacy committee for a bajillion years. Um, and I helped with the annual conference one year I was on that committee. I, as a member of the board of governors during my chapter chair, um, year, I also was on the nominating committee, um, for other board of governors members. Um, I have found the leadership opportunities with Ayla to be like a huge part of my own personal growth and ability to be a leader. Um, I always tell people, you'll never feel like ready to be in charge of something. You'll never be like, no, I am a leader. Like you learn by doing. And so for me, the first thing I ever officially did for Ayla as an attorney was run our regional conference. Like the chapter chair that year was just like, I need a person, you are nice and seem professional and reliable, you know? And so I ran, I like helped, like I ran the whole conference um, and then um, ended up on the XCOM track and just really loved being um, in the role of like, you know, treasurer, secretary, vice chair, chair, like just all of that. And, and it's like, it creates such meaningful connections to your colleagues that are so important professionally, um, not just for like, referrals, you know, conflicts of interest or just, oh, that's not my thing. It's Sandra's thing. Um, but just having people you can go to, especially if you're, you're um, on your own, like having that network of people to be like, I think I need to include the dumb new 9089 form with my national interest waivers, but is that real? You know, and having people who can be like, yeah, but you know, it's just having those sounding board For colleagues. Sure. Yeah. And volunteering. I also always tell people like that's where so many opportunities happen. You know, you can have as many coffee dates as you want, but if you are volunteering alongside somebody, like you are going to make a different type of impression and you never know where those impressions may lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the first thing I did was a uh, law student division, my local chapter. 
And uh, the person that was on there with me right now, we, we we're essentially merging firms right now for like 12 years later. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's just, it's, a, it's such meaningful relationships. It's life's all about relationships anyway. So it's like, this really is a way to make, you know, outside of high school or you, you new friends you can meet as when you get older, it's hard to make friends, but you can make really good friendships and stuff. And that's really the value of and quality of life goes up tremendously. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Wonderful. If people want to reach out to you or follow you, is there social media or emails that you put out? Yeah. So I've um, basically gotten off of Twitter. So you can follow me on Twitter, but like Twitter is mostly just trolls for me. I went viral on like Fox News and that was like the end of Twitter for me. Um, I do have um, an official. So we have a sorry, I'm really bad at like I said, like all my referrals are like client referrals. Um, we do have a Grell Feist Facebook page. Um, I think my more interesting Facebook pages are my representative Sandra Feist Facebook page. I also have a Feist for House Facebook page. Um, so um, those are the ways to connect with me. I do also connect with um, immigration colleagues on um, my personal Facebook page. So um, feel free to reach out to me that way. I think my picture is a tortoise right now, but I'm not sure. It was a very big pleasure. Thanks. So I love the conversation and I'll be able to touch you soon. I'm going to just end it for the computer crashes. Thank you okay, so much. That sounds good. This was really fun. Talk to you later. <laughs> Bye-bye. 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 Have you ever felt that the road to establishing a successful immigration law firm is riddled with unexpected obstacles and setbacks? I've been there and I'm here to tell you, you are not alone. Picture this. My wife, then girlfriend and I had just landed for a vacation only to be greeted by a voicemail that changed everything. In an instant, once the plane landed, she lost her job, the very one job that was supposed to support us while I launched my own solo immigration law firm. Suddenly, our financial cushion vanished and I was thrust into the high stakes world of entrepreneurship with no safety net. Despite a slow start and a discouraging lack of leads and referrals, I remained determined to build a law firm that provided a five star client experience. After countless hours spent researching, watching, and implementing marketing strategies with mixed results, I eventually began to see my firm's revenues not only surpass my previous revenue and salary as an associate, but double it. Today, I run a successful law firm with a team of associates and support staff, and I'm the proud founder of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox magazine, podcast, courses, workshops, and more. But my journey wasn't easy. I made many mistakes, wasted time and money, and wished I had a mentor to guide me through the challenges. Although I was fortunate enough to find a few peers who offered support, I couldn't shake the feeling that there had to be a better way. That's why I decided to be the change I'd wish I'd seen. This month, I'm thrilled to announce a launch of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox private mentorship and peer group. This exclusive group is designed to bring solo and small firm practitioners in a monthly, private, and intimate setting to hopefully discuss business strategies, share successes, even exchange invaluable tactics that they would have shared anywhere else. By joining this premium group, you'll not only benefit from my hard-earned expertise, but also forging long-lasting relationships with like-minded professionals who are committed to elevating their practices. Space is limited for this game-changing opportunity. If you're ready to make a real, lasting impact on your business, simply email me at info at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com. Again, that's info at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com and I'll send you all the information you need to get started. Don't miss this chance to transform your immigration law firm and reach new heights of success.